we'll make a start. Obviously, if people are a little bit late joining us, that's absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Uh, my name's Lydia. I'm the gallery manager at Onca. Uh, I'm a white female presenting person with short brown curly hair. And today I'm wearing clear framed glasses, gold hoop earrings, um, a pink and blue stripy top and black dungarees. And my pronouns are she, her or they, them. Um, and joining me today is Jay Ho, who's our current exhibiting artist. And we've got two BSL interpreters, Jill Blackadder and Manda Steff. Um, so just a, a few bits of housekeeping before we start. Um, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be shared online uh, in the future via Onca's website um, and it will be transcribed as well. If you experience any technical issues during the event, please um, just pop a message in the chat directly to me and I'll, I'll try and assist you. Um, just sort of content warning before we begin, um, given the nature of Jay's work, um, she will be making reference to sexual violence and rape. Um, after introducing Jay, I'll turn my mic and camera off. Um, Jill and Manda are gonna be taking it in turns to interpret and we'll allow time for them to switch over as we go along um, and as well for attendees that need to, to pin the interpreter whilst screen sharing happens. Um, the structure for the event is as follows. So I'll introduce Jay um, and the exhibition shortly. Jay will then uh, share a video clip with everyone and talk about the process of making the series of paintings as well as the inspiration and stories behind them. The exhibition is split into two parts and Jay will talk about each of them respectively and there'll be a break in between to take some questions from myself and also from the audience. Any questions that you have for Jay, please post in the Q&A facility. If you have any issues with this, just um, message me in the chat, but hopefully it's um, quite straightforward. So yeah, I'm gonna just introduce Jay now. So Jay Ho is an identical twin, born in Oxford to Singaporean and Malaysian parents. She currently lives in Hastings and Jay studied fine art at Central St. Martins and the Slade and has exhibited nationally and internationally. Recent shows include Dazzle Ship NN201 in 2017, where she painted a Hastings fishing boat in Dazzle Ship camouflage, which we might learn a little bit more about later, and Nigel Cook's telescope show at the Jerwood Gallery in 2019. The Vanishing Act is her first show in Brighton and is funded by Arts Council England. Jay, um, Jay's day job, she works for the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and has worked on human rights since 2017, including on the International Criminal Court, Freedom of Religion or Belief and the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative. The Vanishing Act is a powerful body of work that addresses war crimes, focusing on the plight of comfort women in Japanese occupied World War II countries and sexual violence survivors seeking justice. This exhibition is Onka's first online exhibition with an accompanying window display and it runs until the 22nd of November. It features 17 paintings in total, which are split into two parts. All of the paintings are available to view on the Onka website and three are currently on display in the gallery window. Um, so Jay, if you could please let us know your pronouns and give us a, a visual description of yourself, that would be great. Thanks. Um, sorry, I've never done this before. So um, I'm female. Uh, I've got long black hair. I'm wearing a kind of snakeskin patterned dress. And um, uh, uh, my pronouns are she and her. That's great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Jay, to start, could you just tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind um, making this, this series of work, The Vanishing Act? Thanks, Lydia. Well, yeah, you, you mentioned that I work for the um, FCDO on human rights. And I think this has got, um, it, it's kind of inspired me because I, I'm quite passionate about um, human rights and I experienced um, quite a lot of um, interesting things um, as a policymaker, um, but 
what um, kind of drew me to making these paintings was when I went to Cambodia on a business um, trip, um, I was working on the um, ECCC, which is the, the courts to kind of trial um, former Khmer Rouge leaders. And I went to S21, which is a notorious um, Karma Rouge prison where thousands were tortured and executed. And there was um, a photograph on the wall of uh, Pol Pot and his um, senior leadership um, team. And these images had been scratched out. So the faces were scratched out and they were really powerful. Um, it felt to me that they had been kind of attacked by scissors or, or knives by maybe family members or survivors. Um, that really spoke to me. And when I work for the FCDO, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm doing lots of positive things, but I like to explore the perspective of the victim in, in my art. And I kind of wondered why I was so interested in this, um, but actually this, this kind, of, um, kind of led me to look into my personal history. And I remember my mum telling me stories about um, her sisters. Um, so my mum grew up in Malaysia and um, she was very, little at the time but she had older sisters and during um, World War II um, the Japanese occupied Malaysia and my um, aunts had to um, cut their hair short and dress as boys um, because um, they wanted to um, avoid uh, attracting the attention of Japanese soldiers because they would take local women and um, enforce them into uh, sexual slavery in military brothels that um, were set up around the country. So the, this kind of led me to, to paint about these experiences that um, my aunts must have gone through. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, could you sort of explain, you use the term comfort women. Um, could you just, yeah, sort of clarify what, what, that, what that term means? Well, I think, I mean, I think the term comfort woman came from the Japanese government. It does sound quite cuddly and, <laughs> You know, yes, uh, perhaps, you know, the, the Japanese soldiers took comfort, but actually um, it is a, a euphemism for um, a, a woman to give sexual services to um, Japanese soldiers. So this, I understand, was set up by the Japanese government because they didn't want the Japanese soldiers to go and kind of rape and pillage at, at will. So this was almost like a systematic way of survive, uh, of, of satiating um, soldiers' sexual appetite, um, which sounds really bizarre because in some ways it's quite, I don't know, <laughs> efficient and clean and clinical, but also very brutal and you know sadistic comfort women had to service 30 or 40 Japanese soldiers a day and um, at the end of the war a lot of them either committed suicide or were killed by Japanese soldiers um, although I can't you know, clarify if that is a fact or not, because, you know, we don't know. But I'll talk about that more. And could you um, sort of explain the, the title of the exhibition, The Vanishing Act, what, what that references? 
Yeah, so it references a few things. Um, so tomorrow is Remembrance Sunday. And for me, it I always remember the fallen soldiers. It always seems to be um, about, you know, the men who fought in the, the trenches. And I, um, I think, you know, maybe other people's kind of um, experiences are, are similar or, or different, but I do believe that we need to remember the experiences of um, civilians and, and the, the countless of women who were raped. Um, I know it's not just in Southeast Asia. I know a lot of women were raped in Russia. Um, and sadly, if we don't remember this, then, you know, how, how can we <laughs> make sure it doesn't happen in the future? And unfortunately, rape in war is something that happens all the time. So it was, so the Vanishing Act is, is kind of commenting on the fact that, you know, there is little history about um, sexual violence in World War II. But also it's talking about how I um, kind of obscure the images in my paintings. So I use kind of prisms or um, kind of pixels or various shapes. Um, and I do that um, to either kind of condemn the image or, or protect depending on the subject. Um, so yeah, you, you can never really kind of clearly see who is the subject of the painting. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think Jade, if you want to share your screen and then um, start the video clip and I'll turn my, my mic and camera off whilst you do that. Brilliant. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I make my work. Now, I, yeah, I studied at Central St. Martins and Slade, but actually I didn't study painting at all. Um, so I'm kind of, um, when I do paint, I'm, I feel like I'm making it up. Um, I only started painting when I had had children. I found that it was a lot easier to paint than to sculpt with sand and cement, for example, because I could have a baby carrier with my small child in it. I put a like a cloth over his head and then I can paint, um, which is amazing because as you know, mums and dads out there know, there's hardly any time to do things like paint. So if I had a, a spare 30 minutes, I could go and, and paint, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm now gonna show a clip of me painting and let me just share my screen. Oh, hang on. And one, one other thing just to mention before I share is the music that you'll hear is um, from Mordant Music and it's a travelogue called Sporchard and it's um, based on field recordings in Singapore.
Um, hang on, let me just, oh, hang on, let me just stop share. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, so as you can see, um, I've, I've paint really quickly and everything's quite rough and ready. Um, I paint on plywood that I, I cut by hand, so it's a bit wonky. Um, I paint, I work on maybe three paintings at a time. And I use I, a lot of linseed oil mixed in with my oil paint, so it's quite drippy. So those short animations that you saw were actually photographs of my paintings in progress. Um, so I kind of start with quite primary colours um, to kind of fill in the areas and then I just, you know, paint over the top. Um, so a lot of things you, you can, you don't really see at the end, but I quite like that. So actually all the paintings of people's faces, I actually really do, I, like, I don't like skip, <laughs> cut corners. I do paint the whole face, even though I'm going to kind of obscure it afterwards. I really enjoy painting and I would often play my music quite loud. Um, I love the tactile nature of painting. Um, and as you can see, after the, the paintings have been done, I kind of mask off areas um, of the face. Um, so I get through loads and loads of masking tape and so I, um, um, I, I kind of spray paint over the top and I kind of basically make it up as I go along. I, it, there's no kind of um, particular um, way I, I, I plan them. They just, just, I just look at it and, and decide what needs going where. Um, but I, I really enjoy it. And I think it's actually really important for me to have this intuitive process because my day job is so analytical and so precise that it's quite nice just to kind of let off a bit of steam. So I love it. Um, so, so, um, so that's how I, a little bit about how I make my work. Um, I'm now gonna introduce the exhibition. So um, as Lydia mentioned, um, because of COVID, the gallery had to be closed. So I thought I would show my work in two parts and probably, you know, for, for a selfish reason that I thought I could show more pictures in the window gallery that way. So part one is about my family history and it's about my aunts and the Japanese perpetrators of war crimes in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, I'll just play you um, the video and then I will stop and pause and talk a little bit more. Okay, hang on a minute, let me just do this one. So this painting is called The Colonel Vanishes and it is of, sorry I can't pronounce it, Suji Masanobu um, who was a tactical planner for the Japanese Imperial Army and he planned the invasion of Malaysia and um, also organised Suk Ching which was the um, massacre of thousands of ethnic Chinese men in Singapore. So a little bit about what happened to him was he managed to escape 
uh, and evade capture at the end of World War II. So he was never put on trial for Sukhching. Um, but later um, he, he vanished in Laos um, in the 60s. So um, I thought it was quite apt um, that I would paint him and, and call this piece The Colonel Vanishes. Uh, you'll see that over his face I've painted prisms and the shapes I thought was important to reference um, sword cuts. So they look like cuts across his face. You might be able to see in the, the bottom right hand corner that you can see his, his sword hilt. Um, as I understand, they used to carry swords, um, the Japanese army. Um, so um, moving on, um, my next painting is of my aunt on my dad's side. So she grew up in Singapore. You can see here in this picture that this is obviously a painting of a photograph. So I actually paint from photographs and, and this photograph actually is on the wall of my dad's room. He's in a nursing home and um, he loves this picture because he loves his, uh, his sister very much. And um, I don't actually know much about um, my aunt's experiences in World War II, because I never asked her. But I do know that in Singapore, a lot of women from other Japanese occupied countries were brought in to be work, to, to work as comfort women. So a lot from South Korea and the Philippines, for example. Um, this is my aunt, her name is Gladys and um, she was very religious. She um, was a Roman Catholic um, and she never married. Um, you can see that in this painting that there are lots of paint drips, um, which um, is a result of me using a lot of linseed oil mixed in with my oil paints. I quite like the drippy nature of it. Um, and the colours I use are inspired by Peranakan culture. Um, Peranakan is when the um, Chinese diaspora um, mixed with uh, local people. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, like mixed race. Um, so, so my dad, my, my grandfather is Chinese, but my grandmother is um, Indonesian. So Peranakan is like a, a local mix. Um, so, and um, the, it, the shapes and the colours um, um, over her face also reflect dazzle camouflage, which was invented by an artist, um, Norman, Norman Wilkinson during World War One, and he used to use this on ships, you know, British ships during the war. And the idea was that um, the, the shapes would obscure the, the ship's key features. So if you were a German in a U-boat looking through a periscope, you would find it difficult to tell which direction the ship was going in. 
And I really like dazzle camouflage. I, I love it. I find it bright and vibrant and um, just fantastic. Um, no two dazzle camouflaged boats are the same. And I, I use this a lot in my um, work. Um, moving on um, is another painting of one of my aunts, but from my mum's side. So I'll just play the video. So this is a painting called First Auntie because this was um, my mum's oldest sister. Um, she was 15 years old when the Japanese occupied Malaysia. So in Malaysia, there was more coercion of, of local girls into sexual slavery for the Japanese military. So the, in this painting, the prisms over her face are there to protect her identity. Um, I actually painted this from an, an old black and white photograph. So all the colors you see are made up <laughs> um, and the background texture kind of reflects the, the grain of the photograph. And this photo must have been taken after World War II, but literally maybe one or two years after the end of the war. The next um, piece is actually um, called um, Memory Space Peranakan Woman, and it's a painting of a comfort woman statue over a photograph. So in this, um, it um, is a painting over an old work that I did. And the, the photograph is actually of a model of my childhood bedroom created from memory. And then I painted over the top um, with this uh, comfort woman statue. And this work is kind of um, a bit of a self-reflection. When I made the original work, the process of making a model was part of my, um, uh, what's the word? Um, it, it revealed the psychological feelings I had for the space. So obviously my bedroom doesn't look like that at all. It looks pretty grimy <laughs> and in disrepair in, in the, um, the photo, but actually it doesn't look like that at all. Um, and it was basically 
a reflection of the fact that I didn't particularly enjoy my childhood. And this is in um, Oxford, growing up in Oxford. Um, so this, this work is actually kind of almost ridiculing myself because actually, you know, I really don't have anything to complain about because my childhood was nothing like my aunt's. Um, so yeah, it, it's a bit of a, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's, yeah, anyway. Um, and the reason why I've painted a South Korean comfort woman statue over the top is actually, I've, I've turned her into a Peranakan woman because there is little acknowledgement that there were Malaysian comfort women at all. So I thought, you know, it would be good to have some kind of, you know, statue like this South Korean um, comfort woman statue. Um, moving on um, is another painting about my childhood. And this one is called Reading Festival. Now, this is um, based on a photograph of me in um, with my friends at Reading Festival, which is a large music festival quite close to Oxford. And I'm about the same age as my aunts during World War II. And this was to kind of contrast my my childhood with my aunts i i paint about my aunts but i did not experience what they experienced so it's really important for me to acknowledge that um i obscure my face in this and i think i do this because you know at the time i was a self-conscious teenager I'm an I'm an identical twin so identity was a big issue for me um, actually with the dazzle um, camouflage it references facial recognition technology and I often um, <laughs> get um, photos of my sister, my twin sister, um, lumped in with photos of me because obviously the computer can't tell us apart. So I think this is very much to do with me wanting to be individual. Obviously I'm wearing um, devil horns, which I thought was amazing at the time. <laughs> and, um, you know, it is kind of a, a comment on, on how my childhood was completely different and I was battling with far different things in comparison to my aunts. Um, back to um, a painting of my aunt now, so I'll just play that. <laughs> So this is of my second auntie. So that's second eldest in my mum's family. 
And this painting is called Miss Ipo. So Ipo is a city in Malaysia where my mum grew up. And my aunt actually won Miss Ipo beauty pageant. And an uh, interesting fact is that um, Michelle Yeoh, who is an actress, um, maybe most famous for being a Bond girl, was also born in Ipo and won Miss Malaysia. So she, my aunt was um, 13 um, at the time of um, the Japanese occupation. Um, and I have like completely masked her face to protect her, her beauty. And actually, um, when I was reading about women in other conflict situations, um, they often rub dirt in their faces and not brush their hairs um, to kind of make themselves less attractive, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, my next painting, which is the last of part one, is of another Japanese perpetrator. So this, hang on, let, shall I do, hang on, let me, shall I move it back? Ooh, there we go. <laughs> um, so this is an image of Tomoyuki Yamashita, who was a Japanese general who led the invasion of Malaysia and Singapore, and was also involved in defending the Philippines from advancing Allied troops. Um, Churchill actually said that the fall of Singapore um, was the worst disaster in British military history. Because of course, at that time, Malaysia and Singapore was part of the British Empire. Now, this painting is called Yamashita Standard and this references the um, a term used by international criminal courts um, which is command responsibility so it's the um, the act of pinning responsibility for troops actions onto senior figures so Yamashita was found guilty for his um, troops atrocities and he was executed, but actually there was no evidence that he approved or knew anything about them. And this is really interesting for me because of my day job, I was working on the International Criminal Court and they use this um, command responsibility a lot and it is incredibly difficult to prove but it's you know what, what can people do if I don't know if, if there were courts um, kind of putting foot soldiers on on trial they'd, they'd it just be insanely <laughs> um, long expensive slow um, so I see why um, for international justice, this is an attractive option to, to go for the most senior person responsible. Um, so that is that for part one, and I will stop sharing my screen now. Okay. <laughs> Drink some water. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. It's, it's um, yeah, in, interesting and kind of harrowing to, to learn a bit more about the specific experiences of, of the people depicted in your paintings and um, yeah. So I've, I've got a few questions um, for Jay specifically about that part of the exhibition, but um, we'd like to open it up to um, the audience as well. So if you have questions for Jay specifically about what, what um, she's just shared, if you could put them in the Q&A facility, which you should be able to see along the, the bottom of your screen, and I'll, um, I'll read some of those out. Um, so yeah, Jay, what I wanted to ask you specifically about um, your use of dazzle camouflage. I, I find this really interesting as a kind of visual motif that's running through the, the series, um, particularly because you're taking something that was weaponized or, or used to kind of aid the, or protect the war effort. And then, um, yeah, by appropriating it, you're kind of highlighting the harm that was done by the war and you're, use, you're kind of using it, turning on its head to protect the victims. Mm. Um, and this, you know, this is, something that was supposed to invisibilize a threat. Um, yeah, could you, could you just say a little bit more about, about how you use that and, and your reasons for doing so? Yeah, well, I don't know. I, I mean, I love it. I, as a visual like thing, it's brilliant. Um, I love the fact it was made by an artist working for the Royal Navy. So I think maybe that has a link with, with my kind of work as, as an artist and, and a policymaker. Um, but I also love the fact that it's camouflage, but not in the, you know, regular, like, let's blend into the <laughs> background. <laughs> it's like quite the opposite. And, and I also love the fact that it was, we, we don't know how effective it was. Like actually, certainly with, with the um, advent of radar, it was completely, um, you know, uh, not uh, useful whatsoever, but it just looks great. And I don't know, I, I feel like there is something there about, you know, boosting people's morale or just this kind of, this thing which kind of has a really great effect that you might not kind of originally think would would be helpful, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Someone's posted a, a question specifically about dazzle camouflage. I don't know if I read this out now as we're kind of on the topic. Um, so yeah, someone's saying, I had a question relating to the dazzle camouflage over face of perpetrators, mm -hmm. Yamashita standard in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, shapes seem much sharper, like broken mirror slash glass, compared to those used on the family portraits where the shapes are somehow rounder slash softer. Was that intentional or did this just happen as you painted? Yeah, that, that was intentional. Um, with the Japanese perpetrators, they are almost like, uh, like samurai cuts or kind of, you know, it, it was meant to be more violent and it was meant to be kind of kind of, um, yeah, condemning the, the people. Actually, those in those photographs, I um, painted them in negative as well. And um, yeah, I, I don't know why it, I didn't kind of just go into Photoshop and change the, the image to negative, but I just painted it in my, in my brain, like, you know, white was black and black was white. Um, and that was kind of just to kind of highlight the, you know, the irony that they're there in their fancy, you know, military uniform with all their medals and, but, you know, they're just kind of a, little bit, <laughs> I don't know, a bit nasty, <laughs> I don't know, war criminals, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's been a kind of follow on uh, question from, from someone else. I'll, I'll try as much as possible to get through the questions from, from people, but we may not get time for all of them. Um, so someone else has asked, um, or said, said rather, it's so interesting that you obscure faces. One of the primary visual differences between the paintings of the perpetrators and of the women is the pattern textiles that the women wear. Did you want your anonymous women to, to at last be free to show their femininity without consequence? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I'm really pleased that you kind of 
picked that up because of I hadn't even thought about it. So I love hearing um, people's views because, you know, often I'm just painting and just like, you know, I'm really focused in on what I'm doing, but I don't actually kind of step back and think about those things. But I think you're absolutely right. Um, when we when I talk about part two, there's um, one particular image where you don't see any of the, the woman at all, apart from maybe a glimpse of jewellery and a glimpse of skin. And I think actually that is very much, you know, to do with identity and, and you know, that, yeah, yeah I, I think that that's great. <laughs> Okay, we've got one last question. Um, so someone's asked, how much empathy developed during your portrayal of people who are now gone? In particular, did you feel in some way that you were bringing back the contentious, sorry, you were bringing the contentious figures back to life? Um, yeah, I don't know, actually. I think, I feel like in history, a lot of people focus on the perpetrators more than the victims. So I think you actually, you find it, there are a lot more images out there of like, you know, generals and commanders. Um, so in some respects, I think they've already got quite a lot of life there, <laughs> I don't know, in history. But, you know, the, the women who were raped or the women who had to you know, hide and, you know, that that's kind of, that's a different thing, I guess. So for me, it was really important to paint my, my aunts and put them side by side with the, you know, the Japanese perpetrators as, as equals almost. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess if you want to move on to, to part two. Oh, someone's just put a question in there. Let's, we've got time to do this uh, last one. Um, so that was following up from the, the question that was just asked, the same person saying, I asked this because the symbolic pinning of blame on high commands seems to have triggered your questioning of where blame lies. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, in some respects, yeah, you should go with like the most senior person because if it was, you know, a Japanese military policy to have these comfort women stations, then, you know, the, the soldiers were just following orders. So I, I do see, well, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. But then, you know, the, the soldiers are actually doing the raping. So what, <laughs> are, they, are they blameless? I don't know. <laughs> it's really, it's a really difficult one. Yeah. Thank you to those people that asked questions. Um, yeah, thank you, Jay. Should we move on to part two now? Brilliant. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just give a quick introduction before playing the video again. Um, so in part two, um, I focus a bit more on comfort women and survivors seeking justice and also perpetrators standing trial. And the music you hear um, is also from Mordant Music, from a travelogue, but this time the field recordings are made in Japan. So let me just play my video. Um... <laughs>
So when I was exploring the issue of comfort women, I would Google search images. <laughs> so this is actually an image I found of a Japanese soldier with a number of comfort women. And I pixelated both of their faces, but the, the Japanese soldiers a bit more than the, than the women's. And, but regardless of that, you can still see that he's got a massive grin on his face. And you can also see that the comfort woman is looking a bit unhappy and concerned. And this painting is called On Duty. And it's actually talking about the comfort woman being on duty when the soldier is off duty. And because I'm dealing with quite you know, dark subject matter. I was trying to use a, a lighter colour palette to um, <laughs> lift the mood somehow. Um, but yeah, that, that was why I used a lot of pinks and purples and that. Um, the next one is of another photograph I found on the internet of um, Comfort Women. <laughs> is um, actually taken from a film still um, of a, a Chinese soldier standing over the remains of what we think are comfort women. This was after the end of the World War II. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it was reported that comfort women were either forced to commit suicide or killed by Japanese soldiers. So this painting is called The Clean Up. So it references the removal of evidence that sexual slavery happened. Um, I pixelated the image so you can't see the remains. Um, actually, the, the, the video that, that I took this from also pixelated the images. Um, it's really important not to kind of show gore for me I, I mean it, it's just um you know there's a line to cross isn't there uh, <laughs> between um kind of outlining the horror but also kind of making something sensational so for me the pixels does does this um so the next one is to do with um, the remains of the, the people massacred in Suk Ching. from Sukchin um, victims. And this was taken, that well, they were discovered 
um, when um, a part of, of Singapore was going to be developed for new housing. So they you were digging the foundations and they found all the um, skulls and, and bones that come across a mass grave. Now, my dad used to tell me stories about how men with the same surnames would be rounded up by the Japanese soldiers, asked to dig holes in the ground, executed and pushed in. Um, it's lucky that my, my dad's family wasn't affected. Um, my uncle could speak Japanese, so he could translate um, for the, the Japanese soldiers. So I think that might be one of the reasons why they were spared. Um, so yeah, quite, quite dark. Um, the next um, painting I'm going to show is based on a, a famous Japanese woodblock print um, by Utagawa Kunish, Kuniyoshi, on, um, which is called um, Takiyashi, the Witch and the Skeleton Spectre. <laughs> the Japanese government announced that Japan was not responsible for the issue of military comfort women. So there was a, a woman called Kim Hak Sun who stood up and she was the first woman to stand up and testify about her experiences as a South Korean comfort woman in 1991 and she was 67 years old. Um, she's extreme, extremely courageous. I, I can't, I can't imagine how difficult it must have been to stand up. But through her courage, more women stood up, and around two hundred from South Korea, Philippines, Singapore, and North Korea. Um, unfortunately, she passed away before the Japanese government actually did apologise. It's still a contentious issue between South Korea and Japan. Um, I, they, the Japanese government apologised in 2015, but um, South Korea didn't believe that the apology was sincere. So in this painting, um, it's based on this famous Japanese woodblock print and Takayashi the witch is the, the figure on the left hand side and that in this painting is Kim Hak Sun. The kind of figures in the middle, the, the, the blue pixels, they are two fighting samurai um, but in this painting it is um, the Japanese government and so I like um, the fact that this this painting is almost um, kind of showing that Kim Hak Sun is is conjuring up a, a, a skeleton spectre who are the comfort women who couldn't speak up or who passed away and she's kind of fighting their their cause. Um, I pixelated these um, images quite, quite a lot just to kind of ascribe these new identities uh, to to them. Um, the next painting is um, of a far more um, current conflict, um, looking at the 2012 civil, civil war in Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs>
So this picture is based on a photograph by Diana Zainab Al-Hindawi. And it's of a woman standing in court in Goma, which is in North DRC, testifying um, against um, a number of soldiers who sit meters behind her. That is why she's wearing this um, disguise to hide her identity. So this is actually the first and only <laughs> picture <laughs> that I did where I didn't have to um, obscure the image afterwards um, because she was already hidden. Um, you can see there's a glimpse of her jewellery. She's wearing a gold necklace. And also you can see a little bit of her, um, her wrist. Um, but ultimately she's fully covered. Actually in this trial, so what happened was there's a, there was a village called Minova and in 2012, um, DRC soldiers um, raped and pillaged and um, at least 76 women and girls were, were raped over 10 days. Um, there was a trial, but actually um, of the 39 um, soldiers accused, only two low ranking soldiers were committed with one individual rape each, um, which is really very depressing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's quite um, upsetting that these women are not going through getting the justice they they deserve and you know having to recount their experiences is incredibly traumatizing and they experience stigma from their communities from for being raped so it's um it's an awful situation um my next painting is about um, the Cambodia genocide. So in the Cambodian genocide, um, up to 3 million Cambodians were killed during Pol Pot's regime in the 70s. Yes, mid to late 70s. Um, and you can see these skulls in cases in, um, in the killing fields in Phnom Penh. Um, and I also painted um, an image of one of their perpetrators. Ing Seri. This painting series all started here, really, um, with the uh, photographs that were scratched out. Eng Seri was one of the co-founders and senior members of the Karma Rouge, and he was char charged with crimes against humanity and genocide at the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Um, but he died um, before um, he, uh, the case could be brought to verdict. He was 87 at the time, um, highlighting how long <laughs> justice takes, um, a very long time. Um, I was actually visiting Cambodia because the ECCC courts um, was facing a financial difficulty 
and they were about to close if they didn't receive any more funds. So I managed to get a UK donation of um, about um, three quarters of a million pounds um, so that they could keep on going. So that was why I was in Cambodia. Um, on to another genocide. Um, the next painting is about Srebrenica. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. <laughs> So these um, are some of the skulls of victims of the Srebrenica genocide, where 8,000 Bosniak boys and men were killed by the Bosnian Serb army um, in 1995. Um, this was actually shown in the Jailwood Gallery, along with a painting I did of the Rwandan genocide. Um, and it was in a, um, an exhibition created by the artist Nigel Cook. And he was talking about this work and saying that actually the, the prisms over the skulls was almost like a dubious vantage point and a, a question of where one stands in, in relation to what one is looking at. Um, and he says that the, the dazzle abstractions decorate, but also obscure the horror. Um, and yeah, I, I think that that sums it up really. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that none of the viewers have ever experienced um, these types of crimes. So, you know, we're viewing this as, as someone who hasn't experienced um, the horrors. Um, we can, <laughs> yeah, anyway, it's, yeah. So I guess it's, it's a question of like how, how we relate to, to what's happened is, is something that I'm exploring in that. And then the next one is of um, Milosevic. <laughs> Slobodan Milosevic um, was the first sitting head to be charged with war crimes in connection to the, the Bosnian, um, Croatian and Kosovo wars. And um, like Eng Seri, he, he died before um, justice could be served. So he died of a heart attack in the detention center when he was uh, about to stand trial. And I've painted um, black prisms over his face, almost like um, like a black spot or a kind of curse or a, I don't know, a condemning kind of kind of action. Um, and I I don't know if anyone remembers at all, but in 2017 there were um, trials for um, another Bosnian Croat general. Um, Praljak, um, and when the um, verdict was announced that he was was guilty, he actually committed suicide in court by taking some cyanide. Um, so I think, actually, 
you know, people dying before justice is served is not um, not uncommon, unfortunately. Um, my last painting is of Dominic Ongwen, and I'll play it to you now. <laughs> And so Dominic Ongwen um, has been in the International Criminal Court since 2015. Um, he was um, a child soldier, actually. Um, so he was kidnapped and uh, forced to fight in Uganda. But then he rose up the ranks and then ended up becoming, um, you know, responsible for a lot of people and the, the troops actions, um, including sexual and gender based crimes and conscripting child soldiers. So we, which is quite interesting because he was a victim and now he's a perpetrator. Um, and in this picture, um, I used the colours of the Ugandan flag in the kind of obscuring of his face. And um, I think, you know, the obscuring was meant to be a bit more clinical. I don't know whether you get that or not. Um, but he stood in the International Criminal Court in The Hague, thousands of miles away from Uganda, kind of trying to kind of be put on trial for um, his crimes. Um, the court case is still ongoing, so we don't know what's going on. Um, I used to work for the um, UK policy on the International Criminal Court and I know how hard it is for the prosecutors to, to find people guilty. Um, so I was quite interested in, in painting these perpetrators. Um, and that is it. Um, I just play the last bit of the the, the video of just an installation shot and then I'll stop screen sharing my screen. There we go. Ah, hang on. Stop share. Okay. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I realised um, something we didn't say um, was that we we kind of installed all of the paintings in the gallery, um, even though we we knew that we couldn't um, open it to the public, so that we could get that video footage and and hopefully give people a some sense of of the scale and the kind of aesthetic qualities of the the paintings, even though most of them are only available to view online. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions relating to part two, please pop them in the the Q and A. Um, but I'll just ask Jay one question just to get us started. Um, I think for me, Minova, um, the, the painting based on the, um, the trial in, in DRC is one of the most striking um, in the series. It's something that I keep returning to again and again. It's currently in, on display in, in the window of the gallery. Um, and yeah, there, there are a few paintings in part two that make reference to, to stories that are, are more contemporary and, and happen in other parts of, of the world. But yeah, I was just sort of interested as to why you'd included those um, in the exhibition. If you could tell us a little bit more about that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, like DRC was only eight years ago. I mean, it's it's I think it was really important for me to actually show that unfortunately <laughs> sexual violence and conflict is is still a live issue you know Rohingya Muslims in, in Myanmar is a case in point um, it's really sad that it's still happening um, so I wanted to place um, kind of a reference to, to something more more contemporary just to show that yeah, you know, World War II is 
ages ago, but but now, you know, things are unfortunately not not great. And actually, um, I was um, when I was working on war crimes, I was responsible for the international justice program. So there was a number of um, kind of projects that the UK funded, and there was one that I funded in DRC on kind of sexual violence and basically trying to um, help the DRC authorities kind of do do this better, you know, kind of help the prosecutors put cases together for sexual violence crimes um, to get those the convictions. Thank you. Um, so someone's posted, um, wow, really powerful and sobering work. Did you feel, I think maybe it's, how did you feel learning about these atrocities? Or how do you, how do you feel learning about these atrocities has affected your mental health in any way? Apologies if <laughs> um well okay th this is this is water but but you know it could equally be vodka so um but i will probably have a vodka later <laughs> afterwards um yeah good question um i think um i don't know it, it's it's a weird one like it is quite depressing well, I mean, what, what am I talking about? It's really depressing, um, all of this subject matter. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I think, you know, on occasion, it, it does feel like, you know, there's so many awful things happening. But because I feel quite lucky to be in a position where I can actually do something, which is quite empowering, so I think if I wasn't in that situation where, you know, I didn't, you know, I couldn't, you know, progress or help, help you know, give UK funding to, to help the Ugandans prosecute war crimes or, or Colombia, then I would feel helpless. But, you know, because I can do that, it, it's, you know, <laughs> it helps. <laughs> And vodka, obviously. How um, I'm interested, Jade, because obviously you're in this quite unique position where you have your your day job of working, um, you know, on kind of policy, very, which will have very direct results, albeit in in maybe quite a a slow way. Mm. And then you have your artistic practice where you're, you know, raising awareness of of um, historic events but also how contemporary they are mm. how do you what's the relationship like between those two kind of things for you how do yeah how do they kind of fit together and inform each other yeah I mean when I was when I started working on human rights I felt like a fish out of water I had like complete um imposter syndrome like I don't have a legal background you know I've got two art degrees most of my colleagues had like I was line managing someone who had a, a a PhD in international criminal law and I was like <laughs> what am I what am I doing like but actually um I think my creative kind of mindset I mean I, I used to approach problems in really tangential ways which I think was actually an asset um because you know <laughs> I don't know like you know my, my colleague my legal colleagues were absolutely brilliant but sometimes like common sense or or things which you know they wouldn't see because they have a different mindset they would just yeah they, they would miss that and I guess with my art it was very important for me to kind of explore policy in a different angle um so I think they go hand in hand um I did feel quite frustrated at times that international justice seems to be kind of very much focused on getting convictions and focusing on the perpetrators. But, you know, what about the victims? You know, I don't know. I don't know how someone in, you know, DRC would feel if, you know, 20 years down the line, they get justice for, you know, what happened to them, but the justice is, delivered in the Hague 
and they're like, you know, all oh, right, okay, <laughs> you know, someone's been given um, a sentence, and but like, how how does that really affect their lives? I don't I don't know. So I think with through my art, I was kind of trying to refocus on, you know, the perspective of of the the, the victims or the survivors. Thank you. Um, someone has asked, uh, do you feel like you want to continue portraying such themes in the future or do you feel drawn to paint something else? And if so, what and why? <laughs> um, I don't know, actually, but yeah, I mean, I feel like I should really lighten the mood <laughs> and like paint something really happy. And um, yeah, I don't know, actually. What I'm going to do is just have a little break and and reassess and just kind of figure out what I'm going to do next. Um, but yeah, I mean this this uh, this body of work is actually the most personal and kind of quite um, yeah I don't know quite quite exp kind of put it's put me out there and all all the other work I've done is has been far more kind of you know responding to certain things. You know, I've, I've made work about World War Two kind of bunkers and shelters and, you know, which which, you know, I don't really feature in at all. So th this is very, very kind of personal to me. So I can't imagine doing something like this. I've, well, I don't know, <laughs> ever again, I don't know. But, you know, there'll be. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've got a couple a couple more questions. Um, someone said, earlier you talked about your painting of your childhood bedroom and discussed how your dad was preserved from serious harm by your uncle's translating skills. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that spending so long looking at these harrowing images as you painted them is in part born of some sense of survivor's guilt? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, but I do, yeah, survivor's guilt is an interesting one. I mean, I've I've read. I think I read an, an article about how trauma is passed through generations. I don't know whether that's true or not. I think there was a little study on like rats or something. Like the traumatized mother rat would pass on like genes or I don't know, something <laughs> to, to, to the, her baby rats and they would have like high level stress levels. So I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether that's true, whether that could be true, but I think perhaps, you know, I didn't experience these and, you know, yeah, like my, my parents were okay in the end, but they, they did witness a lot of quite horrific things, but um, you know, maybe a bit of distance is you know it is something to kind of flag that you know I'm interested in it because of I'm looking into my you know what why I'm interested in human rights <laughs> but yeah <laughs> does that answer the question I don't know um, I think it's hard sometimes because obviously this is quite all quite fresh in terms of you making this this um, body of work and maybe you know you might look back on it in a few years time and and have a you know different perspective about the motivation for working uh, for, for making it and, and yeah what kind of drew you to it so I've um, got another question asking uh, do you have a plan to show the work in Singapore or Malaysia? Um, yeah good question I mean the um... I was talking to my um, colleague in Singapore and um, he actually put me on to the um, British Council in Singapore. So they saw my work and they really liked it. And they actually said that Suk Ching is something that isn't talked about much at all. So yeah, there could be potential. I mean, it, it would be quite interesting. Um, yeah, it would be. I mean, uh, yeah, that some, some of the, I mean, comfort women, is, you know, even though it, you know, World War Two happened ages ago, it's almost it's still kind of a live topic. Like, I mean, I mentioned the South Korea Japan issue, but you know, sometimes when I you know post on on Twitter um, some of my images, I, I get in touch with um, 
like Japanese war crime deniers who say like, you know, did, did your mum remember correctly? You know, were they Japanese soldiers or were they, you know, um, South Korean or, or American or like it just, um, lots of kind of comments like that. So, so I know it's quite a live issue. So it'd be interesting to see if, if um, you know, how a different audience would respond to my work. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we're pretty much out of time now. Um, there aren't any other questions that remain unanswered in, in the Q&A. Oh no, someone's literally just put one in there. Okay, we'll do this and then, then we'll finish. Um, Someone said, I wonder if you have read the, gar the Garden If Evening Mist, The Garden If Evening Mists by Amy Tan. There are echoes of your work and historic war crimes of the Japanese. Is that, is that a reference you know about, Jay? No, I don't, but um, thanks for that. I, I, I will read it. Great, I can, I'll send you the title. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, Jay, for, for today and for everything that you shared. And yeah, it's been such a pleasure working with you. And um, yeah, it's just really interesting learning more about, about your process and all of the really important um, stories behind, behind the work that you've made. Um, thank you everyone for, for attending and thank you so much for our, our amazing interpreters, Manda and, um, and Jill. So yeah, we'll, we'll make the recording available um, online soon. And um, yeah, don't forget to, to check out Jay's exhibition. It's still uh, live on the website, the Onca website until the 22nd of November. And um, yeah, there's three paintings in the, the gallery window. If you happen to be in Brighton, I definitely recommend going to, to check them out in person if you can in a safe way at the moment, obviously with COVID. Um, but yeah, thank you, Jay, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye. <laughs>